We're ready, yes. Oh, wow, that's loud. Uh, well, good morning. Happy Easter to everyone. And um, our illustrious worship leader has a problem this morning. He uh, has no voice. But uh, so we, we're going to pray for Mike at this time, and then we're going to improvise. That's, that's Mike in a box there. So we're going to do a... Uh, video of our worship this morning, so we hope you understand uh, that can't be prevented, and Mike feels really bad about it, but we are just wanting him to get well, amen? So let's pray. Lord, we just thank you for Mike. We thank you, first of all, for the opportunity that he has today just to enjoy the message and be blessed by the Holy Spirit, and we thank you for his voice coming back quickly and he being completely healed in the name of Jesus, and we especially celebrate this Easter Sunday, this Resurrection Day. We're so thankful for the opportunity we have to be here, to worship you, and to proclaim your victory through the cross. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. All right. I'm going to turn this on when I remember where I put my remote. Hmm? Oh, yeah, she hid my remote. Okay, there you go. You gotta sit down.
worship the God of wonders. And I am here to drink from the stream of El Shaddai. I have come to listen to my Creator. And I am here to lift up the name of Jesus Christ.
into the darkness Let there be light and there was light Who is the God who made the heaven The sun and moon, the stars and the sky He is the one who is like no other Omnipotent and oh so wise Invisible yet ever present He is the Holy God most high our God. Amen and amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Well, I miss our pastor Mike. He's the best, but we made it. And he truly, is that last song, he is our God. Amen. We thank you, God, for that. Yeah, well, say that again. 
Uh-huh. And what's that mean? He's risen. In Greek, huh? Christ is risen. Say that with me. He's risen. He is risen. He is risen. This is the day we celebrate. The day of his resurrection. Amen. And we're so thankful for it. And with Sherry and family. It's just so good. Little, little girls. Don't test me with this. I can't remember. I'm always calling my grandchildren the wrong names. They're always reminding me. That's not my name. I go, well, not okay. I don't remember your other name, but <laughs> that's right. So yeah, it's so good to see you guys. So Georgia, yeah, here with us today. Oh, good friends for a long time, a long time. Blessed family, very blessed. And speaking of family, if you're joining us by the internet, hopefully Facebook is working today. But uh, YouTube works and our web page works, so you can always go to our web page. It's broadcast is secure every day without interruption. For the, and uh, so we hope you join us on that. And uh, we're going to receive communion at the end of uh, this message today. And uh, we want to pray and ask the Lord's blessing. If you would like to give today, uh, you may do so at this time. And uh, and uh, we're going to, uh, Dennis will pass the envelopes around you might need. And those are online. Remember, you can go to newlifepurpose.org and there's the giving site there. And many of you do that. We thank you for that very much. I hear you got your new home, Chris. It all worked out. Praise God, brother. Amen. Amen. That's good news. That's good news. So go, thank God for that, Chris. So, Lord, we're indeed thankful for the day we have been given. We give because we have received the gift of life through Jesus Christ. And therefore, we give as we can. And you bless us and bless us exceedingly in this life and the life to come. And we give you thanks for your promises. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So if you need an envelope, uh, Dennis is there to serve you. I was trying to think of what to share on Easter Sunday. You know, Easter Sunday is my favorite day of the year, and uh, I think it should be for all of us. You know, the, the early Christians changed the Sabbath to Sunday because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, because they wanted to celebrate his resurrection every Sunday, and so that's why we have church on Sunday. And I titled the message today, Easter Wow, W-O-W, Wow. Can you, you can probably, like me, think of all the different moments about Easter and the wow events that occurred. There are so many. And um, Jesus himself uh, is the reason we celebrate Easter Sunday because of his death on the cross and his resurrection. And he did so many great things. John said he did so many incredible things. Said so many incredible things. Uh, things he said and, and the acts he did and the miracles that there aren't enough books to record all that he did what we have is the four gospels to record some of the events that Jesus did and those are remarkable in themselves so there's lots of wow events that I think that happen uh, at Easter and be leading up to Easter and so I, I chose a few today that I thought were wow events that took place and so I'm going to take you first to the Garden of Gethsemane. You remember he's in the garden, he's praying fervently to the point he has drops of blood from his forehead and he's asking if there's any other way, let this cup be taken from him. And after he's finished praying, comes Judas, one of his disciples, to betray him. And it says in John 18, 3 through 6 in your notes, Then Judas, having received a detachment of troops... And officers from the chief priests and Pharisees came there with lanterns, torches, and weapons. Came to arrest Jesus. Now, the new translations are okay, but detachment really doesn't describe what the old King James said. The old King James described a band of soldiers. Now, a band of soldiers, the number would have been three to six hundred in number. So you have about... 300 or more Roman soldiers weaponized for a fight. You have the officers and those that were us, the military police, so to speak, of the Sanhedrin of the temple uh, police force. And they're all converging on Jesus in the Garden of the Mount of Olives. So the whole countryside is covered in soldiers. 
armed to fight. Now, why did they come so armed to fight Jesus? Because they had heard the stories of his power. They have heard the stories of him speaking to the storm. They had heard the stories of him raising the dead. They heard the stories of him doing miracles by turning water into wine, multiplying loaves and fishes, of walking on the water, of healing and releasing demons from... I mean, this was someone that they heard was very powerful. And they were going to arrest him. And they were concerned that there might be a revolt for someone so popular. And they're also concerned that there might be a fight on their hands. So they came prepared for a fight. When they came to where Jesus was, of course, Judas did his betrayal and kissed Jesus. And then after that, he says to them, knowing that all things would come upon him, he went forward and said to them, Whom are you seeking? And they answered him and said, Jesus of Nazareth. And he said to them, I am. They've added the he here as in italics. The same place they added the he over in John uh, 13, 19. When he said, I tell you before it comes, that when it comes to pass, he's speaking of this day, Easter sunrise, Easter resurrection and the garden. He said, you may believe that I am. And here again, they added in italics, the word he. Because the King James translators just couldn't get with the understanding of who Jesus was. Remember when God appeared to Moses in the burning bush. And Moses says, well, who am I going to tell the Pharaoh? He's the strongest, most powerful man in the world. And I'm going to go talk to him about releasing three million slaves? I mean, what am I going to say to him? And God said, Say that I am that I am. Jesus is referring to who he was. He was God in the flesh. And when he said the word I am that day, it says that when he said I am, they all fell to the ground. You need to get the picture. Here are 600 plus warriors standing all around with their swords ready to be drawn. And he says the word I am and they are knocked on their backs as if an invisible force just lifted them up and slammed them to the ground is what happened. Powerful, powerful Jesus. He didn't go to the cross because they arrested him. He went to the cross willingly. He voluntarily became the lamb. Matter of fact, they took a rope when he said, I am he, and surrendered. They put it around his neck as you would a little sheep. And they walked to the temple with that rope around his neck. The symbolism of him being the lamb that was slain for our sins. The Roman garrison in uh, Jerusalem w was called the Tower of Antonio. The Tower of Antonio was a 75 foot uh, tower that was smooth rock. You couldn't scale it. And from that 75 foot tower in this castle that would house about 600 soldiers you could see all of Jerusalem. You could see the temple. You could see Herod's place. You could see the priests. And they had tunnels that connected them to all parts of the city. So they were quick to answer any alarm. And that's the garrison that came out to Jesus and was knocked on their backs by the words of Jesus saying, I am. To me, that's a wow moment. Now, Peter, being Peter... He thought because everybody's knocked on their backs on the ground and in dazed and bewildered by what just happened, he thinks it's time to attack. So he says to Jesus, it's time to attack, right? Before Jesus can say no, he grabs the sword and chops the ear off one of the officers of the temple. Peter, Peter, Peter. What are we going to do with you? And so here he is, ears chopped off. Jesus is standing there, and they're all on the ground, and Jesus said to Peter, Matthew 26, 53, as he's picking up the ear and putting it back on the head and healing the severed ear, making it completely new again, as he's doing that, he says to Peter, Peter, do you think that I could not now pray to my father? And he would send me more than 
12 legions of angels. Now a legion was 6,000 men. And one angel could kill 185,000 men. So one legion of angels could have wiped out 1,110,000,000. 12 legions of angels could wipe out 13,320,000,000. Twice the population of the earth today. That's how much power Jesus had at his disposal. And yet he laid down his life. He surrendered it for you and I. We need to remember Palm Sunday is, it's not Palm Sunday, but Easter Sunday is a day of victory because he went to the cross for us. And his resurrection brought about a change in our lives and the lives of others. You know, it, it, crucifixion was the most horrible death. Uh, Josephus said it was the most wretched, the historian Josephus said there's no more, no more wretched way to die than the crucifixion. In the Eastern cultures, they would chop the person's head off first, then put them on the cross. But Rome perfected it. They wanted to have the person feel tortured to death from the time they were put on the cross till they took their last breath. So when they put the spikes in the wrists, and they were on that cross bar, and then they put the spike through the two feet, then they had to, to breathe. You had to lift up on those feet in that pain and feel the pain in your wrists, and in this moment, you were feeling all this excruciating pain. You're trying to catch a breath. And this went on for several hours. But it became an even greater problem because as they were holding on to that cross beam with those wrists, their sockets and their shoulders would pop out. And eventually, they just can't breathe at all. And they would die of asphyxiation all the time in excruciating pain and torture till they die. I, I, God's God, I, I, I still don't, it's hard for me to grasp the sacrifice that was required for our sins. That the, he would have to go through that for our sins to be forgiven. But God is just and God's wrath had to be answered for all of us. So he chose the cross to be the way it was answered. And Jesus died on that cross for us in the pain and the torture I know there's lots of crosses for jewelry, and those are all wonderful and pretty, but let's, let's not forget what that cross means. Let, let's not forget the price that Jesus paid for us. Every time I see that cross, I think of the pain and suffering he did for us. And when I think of Easter Sunday, I think it was all worth it. All worth it. As he's breathing his last breath, he says it's finished. At the same time he's breathing his last breath, something else is happening not far away. In the temple, the high priest, at the same time Jesus is dying for his last breath on the cross and says it's finished. Jesus knew his purpose fully well. He said, as he said earlier, I've come for a purpose. I've come to do the will of the Father. What was that purpose? That at the right moment in time, at the right place, he would be on the cross to breathe his last breath to say it's finished. At that very same moment, in the temple, is a high priest who's taken an unblemished lamb to be slaughtered and the blood to be put on the mercy seat on the Ark of the Covenant in the Holy Holies. At that same exact moment is when Jesus breathed his last breath and said it's finished. How do we know this? Because Matthew records an event that is so incredible that even when Matthew writes about it years later, he says the word in Matthew 27 verse 50, he says the word, behold, behold, verse 51. That's that wow word. That's, I mean, it, the, the behold word in the Greek is like, well, when I was a kid, it was holy cow, Batman. I mean, that was that kind of, you know, that was that kind of moment when Batman did his thing. And, and, uh, and his sidekick goes, holy cow, Batman. I mean, it was that kind of behold moment, you know, a wow moment. And, and that Matthew's still having the wow moment when he writes this years later about what happened at the time that Jesus said it's finished. At that time in the temple, there was a, the word in the scriptures uses the word veil, but that doesn't really describe it too well. There was a curtain 
when you went into the, the inner court from the outer court. But there was another curtain that was between the uh, inner court and the Holy of Holies. This, this curtain was 60 feet tall. If you can imagine something 60 feet tall, about five stories tall, 30 feet wide, and it was as thick as your hand. Now that was the curtain that divided the holy place from the inner court. And at the time that Jesus says it's finished, God ripped that curtain from the top down. And the, holy, the high priest is standing there about to put the blood on the mercy seat while God is ripping that. It had to be a horrific sound to hear that curtain rip from some invisible power but what God was doing, he was finishing it. He was finishing the need for the blood sacrifice that was required once a year by the high priest to do the sins of all the people for a year would require the blood on Passover day for a year. He finished it. There would no longer need to be a blood sacrifice ever again because the blood sacrifice was being done and shed right then. The cross was the mercy seat. The blood was the blood of Jesus. And there would no longer need to be a high priest in the temple anymore. There would no longer need to be a blood sacrifice of a lamb because the lamb, once and for all, Jesus Christ was slain for all the sins of everyone. And the Holy Spirit was released to go out into the world. He was no longer contained in one building, in one room. He was now released by the power of God to go forth to convict all men towards righteousness. Invisible hands did a wow thing by ripping that from the top down. The cross has so much meaning so much was done through the cross. The blood of Christ finished it. You know, in Luke chapter 24, we have one of those wow moments. I, I love the story of Jesus' resurrection because there's so many different people that are involved. You know, they had the stone that they rolled over, this two-ton stone that they rolled over the entrance of the tomb, thinking that would stop anybody from getting there. But the angel came and rolled it away, as you know. And the women came to anoint the body of Jesus, and they didn't know anything was going on. They didn't know there was a stone. They didn't. But when they walk up, there's this angel sitting on top of this stone. Now, that's a pretty big wow moment. And, and then, then they walk into the tomb, and there's another angel in the tomb. This was a very young, handsome angel, that says. And he's standing inside the tomb, and they're just standing there blown away. You know, I mean, wouldn't you? I mean, they're perplexed. What does all this mean? We came to anoint his body, but his body's not here. And there's an angel there and an angel here. What? And so the two angels join together to speak to the ladies because they're trying to help them because they don't know if they should cry or run. I mean, this is one of those kind of situations. And, and here's what the angel says. Now listen to this. The angel says this. Now they were afraid and they bowed their faces to the ground because they thought they were going to probably be you know, slain or something. Anyway, uh, why do you look for the living among the dead? Now the angel is talking. He said, why are you here? You're looking for the living among the dead. That should be significant. And then he says something else that we can all rejoice in. Uh, he's not here. He's risen. Remember how he said to you that he was going to come to Galilee and the Son of Man would have to be delivered into the hands of sinful men, be crucified, but he said on the third day he would rise again. You know, there was confusion everywhere. Everybody didn't know what was going on. The disciples were running for their lives, hiding where they could hide in any locked room because they thought they were next. The women came over to anoint Jesus thinking he's dead. Now they don't know what to think, but God had a plan and all the angels knew what that plan was. And Jesus knew that plan. The world was in confusion and disarray, but God's plan was working completely to everything he wanted to have done. 
I want to encourage you. Today this world is a mess. And our nation is becoming more and more an ungodly nation. But you need to take heart. You, if you thought ungodly, you should have been around. Read, read some of the history of the Roman time. I mean, talk about ungodly, perverted. I mean, uh, we got nothing compared to them. And yet God worked his miracle working power to bring Jesus to the cross, to raise him from the dead, and to bring about the greatest move of God's love and grace that the world's ever seen. He's risen. His plan is being fulfilled for you and I. There's no slack in God's hand. There's no limit to what he can do. And then Jesus went around after this. He, he knew the, the guys weren't going to believe the women. You know, he just knew. I mean, they, they run over to the Peter and them to tell them what's going on. And, and they didn't believe them. And so then Peter and, you know, they run to the tomb themselves. And they finally get the message. And then, then he appears to the eleven in the middle of a room that's locked because they're hiding. And he walks through the wall and talks to them and says, uh, look, I'm not a spirit. I'm real. I have a glorified body. I can eat just like you eat. I can talk. You can hold me. You can touch me. And he did that with them in the middle of that room to show himself risen. And then he appeared to others. Remember, he appeared to the two men on the road to Emmaus and talked to them. And they got the message when they were breaking bread with Jesus. He appeared to Thomas. Remember, Thomas said to the disciples, well, I'm not going to believe that. I'm not going to believe it. I don't, care. You, you, I don't care what the women say. I don't care what y'all say. I'm not believing it unless I get to put my hand in his side. Eight days later, here I am, Thomas. My Lord, my God, Thomas said. But the one I like the most is the fishing story. Maybe because I like fishing. Peter and James and John, they're... They've gone fishing. You know why they've gone fishing? Because they have nothing else to do. They think it's over. And uh, Jesus is gone. They've heard he's resurrected. They saw him, but they aren't making the connection. So they went out fishing. They fished all night. Got nothing. In the morning, as they're beginning to pull in their nets, there was a man standing on the shore over there. You know what you do when you see a fisherman. Hey, did you catch anything? That's what Jesus did to them. Hey, did you catch anything? No, we didn't catch a thing. And then the man from the shore said, You know what? Maybe you should put your nets on the other side. Now, if you've ever gone fishing, if you're not catching any fish on this side, it is not going to matter if you're going to throw your hook over there. I mean, that is not going to change anything. And they knew that. But they thought, Oh, well, city slicker. We'll show him. So they went ahead and threw their nets on the other side. And then the nets were filled with fish. Peter got it. Because when Peter first met Jesus, he said, uh, Can I borrow your boat? I need to preach and big crowd here. I need some room. Oh, yeah, sure, sure, preacher. And he preached from his boat. After he finished preaching, he said, Now, Peter, yes, sir, I want you to go out and fish. Master, we, we fished all day and all night. All night, we got nothing. Just, uh, just go try it. And Peter went out and they had so many fish that his boat and another boat and another boat couldn't com contain all the fish. You don't forget those kind of fishing stories when you're a fisherman. Peter knew well who it was. And he dived off the boat, swam to the shore, and there Jesus was with breakfast and a smile on his face. That's my favorite. And of course we know that's when he told Peter his assignment for the rest of his life until he was martyred. Go feed the sheep. He didn't say how many sheep to feed. He didn't say how many days you'd be feeding them. He just said, feed them wherever and whenever you do. I've lived my life following that. Just feed the sheep. Go about doing what you can do for whoever, whenever, at any time. That's your assignment in life. Feed the sheep. And that's what Peter's assignment was. You see... Jesus has assignments for all of us. He showed that to the disciples, that it wasn't over. It was just beginning. You know, when you read the story of Jesus, and you see everything that happened at the resurrection, sometimes you think, you know, if I could just been there, and Jesus touched me, or if I could have been there just to hear Jesus, that would have been the greatest moments in my life. Well, not exactly. That would have been great. 
But the Bible says the greatest moments are not then, when Jesus was on the earth. But the greatest moments are now. You see, Hebrews says this about Jesus. It says, now he's obtained a more excellent ministry. What? His ministry to do the miracles, to heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out devils, to go to the cross, be raised from the dead. Isn't that a great ministry? Yeah. But the one he has today is greater. But sometimes I think we don't see it for the greatness that it is. We don't appreciate what we have today. I don't know what you, as the older I get, the more I realize the things I wish that I appreciated and done about, you know, you get those bucket lists thinking. You know, the ones things I would like to have done and what I didn't do and what I would have done if I could have done it. I mean, we all do that. Well, I don't want you as a believer to not take advantage of the something you've received that is actually the best thing you could have received. Even if you could have been there when he was there, what you have today is greater than what you would have had then. If you wanted to see Jesus then, you had to get to him. You'd have to have friends knock a hole in the roof to get you down to him. You'd, you'd have to walk miles to find him. You'd have to be on the street corner when the mob's coming by, scream at the top of your voice, have mercy on me. I mean, it would not have been an easy thing to get to Jesus when he was walking on the earth. But that's all changed now. Today it says he has a more excellent ministry. He is the mediator of a better covenant. Better than the miracles? Better than the resurrection? Better? Yes. You have a better covenant established on better promises. Now here it comes, Hebrews 4.15. For we do not have a high priest. Where was the high priest when the temple curtain was ripped from the top down? He was in the temple using the blood of the Lamb. Where's the high priest today? He's not in the temple. The high priest today for you and I is seated at the right hand of the Father. You can't get any closer to God than at his right hand. And we do not have a high priest, and here's the even better part, who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. I don't care what you go through in your life, what difficulty you face, Jesus went through difficulties. Jesus went through temptations. People betrayed him. People rejected him. People scorned him. Whatever you feel life has given you in difficulties, understand he understands. He sympathizes with your weaknesses. He was tempted in all ways, yet he did not sin. So why do we have a better ministry today? at our disposal than the day when Jesus was walking because he's the high priest at the right hand of the Father. And it says then, let us come boldly, notice this word, boldly to the throne of grace. Boldly to the throne of grace. The word boldly is a Greek word that says that it's someone that speaks their mind clearly with confidence speaks their mind clearly with confidence. We have a former president that's running for re-election that I pray he will make it. But he is not liked by a lot of people because he's pretty bold. I mean, he speaks his mind, and if he thinks you're something that you shouldn't be, he'll tell you that to your face. I mean, it's boldness, and people don't like him because he speaks his mind. He gets rebuked a lot for telling it like it is. Well, that's the kind of boldness we're to have towards God. We're to have a boldness that says, I know what the promises are, and I know what Jesus has done for me, and I will boldly declare that Jesus will do for me what I ask. That's what boldness means. Not timid, not shy, but being given the opportunity with confidence to declare what God is going to do for you. That's what Jesus is ever interceding at the right hand of the Father for you. Now here's the good part. That you might obtain mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. Help in a time of a need sounds sort of, uh, you know, 
something we do to help people and be nice to people, like a, a gracious act of kindness, but that's not what the word means. It's a military word, help in time of need. It was a Greek word that described what the military would do when one of theirs was in distress. We have it for the police, and you will see it on some TV shows, and they'll go, officer down. And when they say officer down, all the police in the area come immediately to the aid of that officer. That's what that word means. Officer down. Airborne rangers say no man will be left behind. That's that kind of declaration of in the time of the need of that soldier, there will be all forces put to action to bring help to their distress. That's what that word means. What's that mean for you and me? That means Jesus, if he needs to send 12 legions of angels to straighten out the mess that you've gotten yourself into, he will straighten it out. That means if he's got to go and move heaven or earth to answer you, that he will answer it because you are in a time of a need. He sends out the full force of heaven to your aid because you've asked boldly. Just remember when you're praying, Rambo is coming. He is on the scene to help you. To make sure that whatever you have need of will be answered. I think sometimes our faith is weak because we're just not too sure. Well look at these words. Boldly believe and declare that he is there from his throne of grace to bring mercy. What's mercy? Mercy says don't think you're going to ever know it enough to earn it. I've been doing this over 30 years. I still aren't sure what I'm going to do. Um, there's days I wonder, how in the world did I get saved? I just, I think I, some, some days I just feel like I stumbled into it by accident. I mean, you know, th th this is where we are. You have to stop and say, wait a minute. I'm not getting answered because I did this right and that right. And this, I mean, it's good if you do things right. It's good if you're a nice person all the time. But most of the time, we're not nice people. We don't do things right. We try to do right, but we do it wrong. I mean, if we're trying to do it right, we still do it wrong. I mean, this is who we are. If you think God's going to answer you because someday you're getting to the point where you've really got it together, <laughs> wake up. It's mercy. You're never going to get to the point where you deserve to have any prayer answered because you're never going to go to the cross. You're never going to pay the price for the sins of the world. There's only one person that can do that. And he's interceding for you on the right hand of the Father. Think of all the merciful things Jesus did in the four Gospels. The one that touching the leper. Think of that. He healed him by saying the leprosy had to go. But he didn't just heal him. He touched him. He understands the emotional hurt and rejection people have in their lives. When you feel that, turn to God. Turn to him with all your heart. And you're going to sense the presence of the Lord in your life. Because he'll come to where you are in his mercy. We are in the greatest of all times, saints. We're in times of the greatest ministry of Jesus Christ. He is at the right hand of the Father. And billions of people at the same time, anywhere and everywhere in the world, can call out to him and he answers them. Think of that. No matter where anybody is, anywhere in this world, if they'll ask for Jesus, they'll receive him. There's no limits anymore. On Jesus touching anyone anywhere the Holy Spirit's been released from the temple and now is going about all over the world bringing about the age of the church for 2,000 years it's been the age of the dispensation of the Holy Spirit going bringing the Spirit of God to whomever will receive and believe and bringing answers to prayers to whomever will receive or believe these are the greatest days that God's ever brought about upon mankind it's the time of his grace and love abundantly abundantly being supplied by Jesus at the right hand of the Father surely we should rejoice on Easter but we should remember it's Easter every day because he is at the right hand of the Father bringing forth his ministry of help to us in our time of need as we close today I want you to prepare for communion communion is something that we're to remember what the Lord did. And remember, we are at a time in the ministry of Jesus that there's no greater time because he is the high priest. Now, what did the high priest do? Well, the high priest would take the blood of the lamb and put it on the mercy seat for the people. It, it, the blood 
and the mercy seat were symbols of God's forgiveness because they had obediently chosen to believe in the sacrifice of the blood for forgiveness of their sins. Today, uh, this stands for the blood of the Lamb that brings us forgiveness and the body of Jesus that was broken for us on the cross that these two declare that the ministry of Jesus is in your life. And we take a remembrance of that, that our sins were forgiven before we came to Christ, and they're forgiven after we come to Christ. Because Jesus said it, it's finished. There will no longer be a dividing wall between us and God called sin. There will no longer be a partition like the curtain that divides the people from the Holy of Holies. That's gone. Now we have the Lord Jesus Christ at the right hand of the Father. What is it you need to confess to Him? What need do you need to ask to be answered? That's what communion is. Remembering He's the high priest of your confession. He sympathizes. He's merciful. His grace abounds to you. Take this in remembrance of Him. Bring to Him at this time in your thought whatever it is you need to bring towards Him as you partake of it. Father, we thank you for forgiveness that comes by the cross. Your body was broken, scourged. You paid the price for whatever sin we have that is forgiven. And now we remember the blood. The blood that brought about the resurrection power of God into Jesus' life. And it says he was the firstborn from the dead. That resurrection power is in our lives. To only have forgiveness, but sanctification from any and all things that have come against us. Take it in remembrance of what he's done for you. We give you thanks, Lord, for your resurrection power. We celebrate it on Easter Sunday. We proclaim it every day of our lives. It is Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, each and every day for every believer. Now, if there's anyone watching today and you're not sure of your salvation, you can't say to me, I took that communion, Pastor, because I know the Lord Jesus Christ with all my heart. Then you can have the Lord Jesus as your Savior. He's seated at the right hand of the Father waiting for you to ask. He's done everything for you. He's paid the price. He's gone to the cross. He's been raised from the dead. You're the only thing left that's in his way of giving you forgiveness. Will you accept what he did? The Bible says that he so loved the world that he gave his only son that you could have life and life everlasting. Yeah, but what about what I've done wrong? Well, if you can ask any believer... They didn't stop doing wrong because they got saved. I wish that was, I wish there was just a halo that came over my head when I got saved and nothing else went wrong. That is not living a Christian life. Living a Christian life is because he's not just your Savior, he becomes your Lord. He becomes your Lord by submitting to him with your wrongs and asking him to help you overcome them. And that's what every believer walks in. But their salvation is done once and for all when they believe. So say this with me. Heavenly Father, I believe the Bible is true that Jesus Christ died on the cross, rose from the dead on the third day with the resurrection power so that all that believe will have life and life everlasting. In Jesus' name, amen. If that's you today, find yourself a good church. Email us, talk to us. We want to help you. We are thankful that you gave your heart the Lord Jesus. Well, we are thankful you're here today. Enjoyed a great Resurrection Sunday. We pray that Mike will be back next week being able to sing those songs and lift us up in worship as he often does so well. And we give thanks for you to be here. Hope you join us next week. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, we got one more thing to do. Great grandmas. Where's the great grandma? Right there's the great grandma. Yeah, that's a great grandma. So uh, how many... Grandkids, have you got now, Bonnie? 15,000.